we do have a special guest with us. We have somebody who I've had on the Daily Nationalist a couple of times to discuss the Spanish Civil War because he's just translated uh, a book on that. He also does research on the uh, the war in Japan. And he's come here tonight to talk about the Kabbalah and Sabati Zivi and the growth of the Kabbalah and the Jewish secret societies. And that is Didymus Samidid. Didymus, uh, good evening, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. And it's an honor to fill in for Dennis. Well, it's great to have you on. I think this is a great subject um, that you suggested and you, you've come up with some really good notes here that we can use, which I think we can branch off from and have quite a good discussion on, on a lot of these subjects. What, what got you interested in this? Were, were you translating another book or doing some research in particular in this on this subject? Yeah, you know, I'd been interested in the Jewish question for a long time, and I'm not quite sure how I stumbled onto this subject. I know I heard the guys on Myth of the 20th Century, that podcast, so one of them mentioned uh, uh, the Frankist and the Sabbateans offhand one time, and I think I heard about it on Daryl Bradford Smith's I Am the Witness podcast. It's not a, his, he's not around anymore. He's still alive, but he doesn't, doesn't research, but he's got archives up on, on the uh, Wayback Machine. And so I think I heard about the Frankist and the Sabbateans through those two sources and a couple of others. And then I found a book on um, it's called From Frankism to Jacobinism that was written by Gershom Scholem, the um, uh, German Jewish researcher on Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. Uh, he wrote this book originally in Hebrew in the 70s, and then it was translated into French in the middle to late 70s. And so I got a hold of a copy. I got a hold of the French copy and translated it into English. And I'm selling that right now on Lulu.com. And it's not the greatest translation, but the subject is so important and so interesting that I think it's worthwhile anyway. Oh, it's a, it's a great subject. And um, it's, it's really interesting looking at what these these crazy Jews got up to. This Sabati Zevi, I've really enjoyed reading about him today, claiming that he could fly and marrying this uh, marrying this whore and all the rabbis were furious with him but all the Jews were following him as he was as he was claiming to be the messiah it's uh, yeah it's quite fun stuff just just to research basically the, the craziness of it all but it, it all goes back to the kabbalah and this this mystic interpretation of Judaism and you've got some really good notes here that go right back to the beginning so if i just start by summarizing these notes and then um i branch off for for your comments the, fir the first one you you say we had started off with a biblical Israelite religion. Uh, Old Testament Judaism is sometimes what it's called, but it, it's not really Judaism at all. It was basically the, the Hebrew religion. And Judaism is really what came about after Christianity. Talmudism or Rabbinism is also known, is, is basically what Judaism is. It's Rabbinic Judaism. And that started to form uh, when the Jews came back from Babylon or when the Judeans came back from Babylon. Uh, and basically it was the Hebrew religion, but, but with lots of bits added by man. Jesus called it the commandments of men, basically. And it was nullifying the Old Testament. Then we get to Christianity and the Hebrew, many of the Hebrews became Christians. And then we also had some of the Judeans who didn't become Christians. Majority of them were, um, Edomites, uh, which is the, the type of person that, um, Herod was. A lot of the Pharisees were Edomites. So they didn't, they didn't become Christian. What they did, they developed this system of, of Judaism. They ended up uh, codifying the Talmud, and the Talmud was written, I think it was written around about 400 AD, 500 AD. It, it wasn't actually put onto, um, onto text, uh, into text for 300 years after the New Testament was, was formed and written. So it was really in, uh, in response to Christianity, Ju Judaism, was, Judaism was actually formed. And the essential claim of Talmudism was that the wisdom of the rabbis is greater than God and the patriarchs leading to them making endless generations of new law because and, and also this is really where democracy comes from people just talking about things and saying well we, we can change this law and they would have a vote and the rabbis would say well so many of us rabbis have voted for this now we can change this law because we are actually greater than god and the jews themselves can can be their own their own messiah and uh, this is essentially the difference between Judaism and what went before, which which was which was Hebrewism and and Christianity claimed to 
follow on from the Old Testament, which it does. And the, the Jews, they claim to, to really have this, this oral teaching, which is superior to the Old Testament. They ignore the, the rest of the Old Testament. They only look at the, um, first five books, which they leave on the, on the wall of the synagogue in a scroll. They don't actually study that, but they look at the, they look at the rest of it. So this was the, the forming of, of the Talmud and, from there, we get to the esoteric side of it, but uh, this is essentially where where it all began. Do you want to uh, add some comments to that, Didymus? Yeah, you know, we could we could talk about just this part of it all day, and since we're not going to do that, we have to move on. So I won't say too much, but it's just uh, it, it's very interesting about how there's these different stages of the development of this religion, which starts out as what we you know most what you would say the average Christian understands Judaism to be, which is the, the the worship of God through those first five books of the Old Testament and then the historical material that comes after that explaining what happened to these people who were Israelites or Hebrews or Judeans, not Jews. And so um, there's not too much more, I guess, we should say about that other than um, one of the things I wrote down was that there were other, you know, contenders for who was going to be the non-Christian claimant to this tradition. And the Samaritans had a big revolt against the Byzantines two or three times, and they got beaten down. The Karaites, for whatever reason, remained a small uh, and not influential minority. The Sadducees had their political power broken when the temple was destroyed, so they didn't go anywhere. And then I'm guessing that a lot of the Essenes converted to Christianity. So the only guy left standing, for lack of a better uh, expression, were this pharisaical, nomadic tradition that used uh, these the words of men, right, rather than the uh, than the temple. And um, uh, would you like to say anything else before we move on? Yeah, I'll just add, add something about the Essenes. I would agree with you there that I think the Essenes would have become Christian. The Essenes were the sect that rejected what the Pharisees were doing. They they rejected the the uh, proselytizing of these Edomite tribes and making them into Jews. They rejected all of that and they followed the Old Testament strictly by the book. They also used uh, the book of Enoch. So they, they were essentially the ethno-nationalists of the day and they, they lived in a separate sect uh, in Qumran, which is where we get the, the Dead Sea Scrolls from. And and I, I would have assumed that they became Christians. They were they were pure Hebrews. That they, they rejected all this race mixing that was actually going on. In Judea, the um, the Karaites they they claim to stick with just the Old Testament, don't they? And there, I think there are some of them still around today, but they get pushed out by the Talmudists. Essentially, the Talmudists won this battle for who was going to be um, the the opposing side, as it were, between the Christians and and the other ones that were left. Is, is that how you would put it? That's how I understand it. And so once they uh, won that struggle, they then, you know, took over all of the different uh, diasporic uh, Jewish communities all over the world. And uh, some people think that the diaspora only happened after the Second Temple was destroyed, but that's not the case. There were already Jewish colonies in Egypt, in Rome, in Spain, North Africa, and uh, Anatolia and Greece. They already had colonies all over the place. And as to whether these were, you know, how racially mixed they were, I don't know. And they probably wouldn't tell us even if they did know, even if they did know just because of the implications of that. But at any rate, the Talmudists had footholds everywhere. And what they did was they uh, set up trade networks. And the Muslims talk about it and the medieval European chroniclers talk about it. They would have trade routes that would go from Spain all the way to China. And so they could do trade cheaper and more efficiently than their competitors, at least for these long haul voyages for, uh, you know, exotic or luxury goods, really valuable things that were small like silk or incense or gems or gold. So they dominated that kind of trade. And uh, of course, after the Muslims showed up, they worked closely with them as the Muslims conquered Christian areas and westernized European types uh, areas. The Muslim or the the Muslims and the Jews would always work together militarily and economically, and that's part of the reason why the Muslims were so successful is that they had all this Jewish help. But at any rate, um, at some point, uh, they developed uh, this mystical esoteric tradition that today we call the Kabbalah. Can I just add and something origi- there? Can I just add sure. something there? I would just say, um, do, I mean, bef- before that, when you were talking about the diaspora and the places that they had this diaspora, one of, one of the places was uh, Alexandria. 
and that was where yes. we ended up with the, the spurious Gnostic Gospels, and a, and a lot of Gnosticism was coming out from Alexandria, and Gnosticism forms a part of of the Kabbalah. So, I mean, you, you could really trace this esoteric idea that go, goes back to there, and that that would have travelled travelled with them. The, the same ideas that they put into those Gnostic Gospels came out again later on as we'll get into in a bit but i should but i should imagine they were they were collecting little bits from the occult all over the world wherever they wherever they were on these merchant routes and i mean this is where this the, the term merchant comes from because they were always merchants i mean going back into the to the old testament the, the canaanites were merchants that's always been what they're what they're named by there's that famous um egyptian uh, image of, of one of them rubbing, rubbing his hands together. And it's quite clear, you know, this image of the merchant has been with us for, for thousands of years. But I think that the Kabbalah, the, this esoteric idea, we, we can trace it, probably trace it back to, to Babylon. And even though there wasn't that much of it in, in the Talmud, those ideas were still percolating and circulating, but they just hadn't been codified in the same way that the Talmud was. I mean, that, that's the way that I see it anyway. Would, would you agree with that? I would completely agree, and I'd like to mention my friend. His name is Michael Joseph, and he has a website called Rockstar Esoterica and a YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it through Schism 206, and he's done a lot of research into Philo of Alexandria, and I think you and he would agree about this, that Philo is really the connection between the Babylonian magical, you know, Babylonian mysticism and uh, what we would see later in the Kabbalah is that you had a few people like him who were fusing the Western esoteric traditions like what you had in Hellenistic Greece with the Hermes stuff and that that sort of proto alchemy tradition. And then the Eastern stuff, both of that, th those things merged together through people like Philo and became part of the Jewish tradition and then eventually would emerge in a different form later as the Kabbalah. But yes, as you say, they were picking things up all over the place and doing sort of a, you know, a cosmopolitan synthesis, as it were. And those things just um, uh, sort of moved around and, you know, recombined in different forms until eventually it, it became the Kabbalah. So then we, but uh, yeah, go on, continue. Go ahead. So, uh, the, so the Kabbalah emerges as a, as a recognized uh, thing in around the 12th or 13th century in northern Spain and southern France. That's the first time we have any real evidence of it. Uh, I guess I should say the western coast of Spain and southern France. And what they did was these rabbis would come up with this book and they would say, look, this book is a thousand years old and I'm the one who found it. And I'm the guy who really understands all the secrets that are in this book. And of course, it's all spurious. There's nothing to it. They wrote this stuff themselves. You know, they didn't find some secret magical tome somewhere. But like we were just saying, they probably were bringing together all of these these prior strands of mysticism. Can I just and, add something? I'll just, just add something sure. there as well. I mean, later on, we, we get um, the, the spurious book of Jasher that they pulled out from somewhere. And, and there were various other books that they tried to say were apocrypha and they were Old Testament books. And they would pull the wool over the eyes of some of the some of the churchmen. In later years, sure. um, the, these rabbis would say, "Well, we've got we've got this this old tradition, and we've we've found these scrolls, and the, the churchmen would believe it, and they would even go to these to these rabbis for their for their translations." But so so you you think this is the first time that they were really started pulling these scrolls out and saying we we found these old scrolls from somewhere around about twelve hundred, would you say? That is, as far as I've read from studying, you know, like the mainstream scholarly texts on this, that's when they date the first main Kabbalistic text to is around 1100 or 1200. But as you say, you know, this is probably something that they didn't invent at that time. Maybe they had been doing that already for 800 or 1000 years. And this is just uh, like a major breakthrough that they made where it was much more successful than it had been previously or later. Um, so. Uh, they uh, used this as a sort of social technology in which the rabbis who promoted the Kabbalistic ideas could claim uh, authority over other rabbis. And so you've got one rabbi who all he does is teach Talmud in his yeshiva and he's got his students and everything is done out in the open where they just argue with each other over the minutia of this text, and they basically use sort of like a perverted reason and logic, because it's not really reason and logic, it's just hair splitting, it's pill pull. 
Um, but then the Kabbalist can come in and say, well, I've got a deeper interpretation than any of this stuff that you guys have. And I have the authority of this ancient text. And guess what? It looks like a bunch of nonsense poetry, but I'm so smart and I have such a strong spiritual connection to the power of God that I can read this and interpret it for you. And maybe I'll only show you a few pages of it, right, just to prove that it exists. So they they developed all these tricks and tactics, essentially, that they could use against each other, these rabbis, until over the course of about 250 years, all of the rabbis had to become Kabbalists because essentially they had to protect themselves from these kind of attacks from the other rabbis. I'll just uh, add there as well about the the way that it's done, the way that they they would look at um, letters and say that these these letters in the words had a numerical significance, and uh, you could you could add up the the letters that were in the word and whatever the sum of those letters were, any other word that had that sum could be substituted there. So they could effectively just just change uh, whole verses around and say that in actual fact it means something completely different. Uh, based on this this numerology that they were using, was that a part of it at this time, or did that, did that come later on? Do you know, that would have emerged around the same time, sometime between uh, eleven hundred and fourteen hundred, and you can see how this works. You know, in in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, the first five books, everything is pretty clear. You know what God wants, and you know what His people are supposed to do, and if they do it, they're they do well, and if they don't do it, they're punished. It's pretty straightforward. Well, the Talmud. Uh, you know, it, it invents these tactics to where we can try to weasel out of what God asked his people to do. And then by the time we get to this, you can totally invert the meaning. You can you can say that the opposite meaning is the correct one and that anyone who goes for the most direct, uh, simplest reading of the text is actually some sort of fool or naive person. So this is when uh, they really start to get further and further away from um, uh, from the original, you know, Israelite or Hebrew religion, as most Christians would understand it today. And this, of course, is going to lead directly into what you were talking about earlier, which is the the antics of uh, Sabbatai Tzevi. Yeah, um, I, I, did so, enjoy, I did enjoy so he, reading about them. But go on, go on. I was just going to say, I'm just looking at yeah. these, uh, getting these notes here, and you're saying, but just about around about 1500, they were all all doing this they're all kabbalists and uh, they're all coming out with these different occult interpretations of of the bible with with this competition that they had and then you move on to messianism and antinomianism and i and i just wondered if you could um define both of those for for the listeners before um getting into the next bit is that possible yeah so um uh, messiah you know moshiach i guess in hebrew or christ in greek it all means the same thing it means anointed one if i remember correctly that's the meaning of that word it just means one who's anointed with oil and after the you know you you can read you can read the christian interpretation of it and say that the messiah is supposed to be jesus christ and he came okay well, the Jewish interpretation of it is something different because after the temple's destroyed, they believe that there's going to be one or two messiahs, depending on the interpretation. And one of them is going to be like an earthly political king and one's going to be a military ruler. And together they're going to bring the Jews back to Jerusalem and overthrow the power of Rome or the Goyim or the Europeans or whoever it happens to be and institute a millennial age. And so the Jews have a lot of prayers that refer to this. I think um, they have one prayer that they commonly use, which is uh, next year in Jerusalem, which is to say that, you know, a year from now, they're going to finally be restored to their proper place as they see it in Jerusalem. And so messianism is just the belief that there is a Messiah and that he's going to come and he's going to deliver our, our just desserts. And it's not it's not restricted just to Judaism. It's a general thing. But as these people would see it, it means that they ought to be waiting for a Jew who is going to come and restore them to that proper place, which is control of Jerusalem and probably world domination, honestly, is the way it's often interpreted by them. Um, Antinomianism is a difficult thing, but you can just basically interpret it as it's the inversion or the perversion of moral values. What is bad will be good and what is good will be bad. And uh, the idea that will lead into Sabbatai Tzevi here is that he he merged these two things in that when he he claimed that when he came as the Messiah that the old moral law of how you're supposed to behave will be subverted and overturned and that the good will become bad and the bad will become good and so therefore you will not be held 
to the previous moral standards that dictated your community, your political and social life, and that instead you'll be able to do basically whatever you want. That's what those two topics mean. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll, ju- I'll, ju- I'll just add, I think the um, the term Messiah, I think originally it came from Meshach, which was the name for the crocodile in the in the Nile, and the oil that they would use from this crocodile, they would, they would anoint their kings with, and and the anointing oil took o- took over the name as as the anointed one. And I think that's where where it originally came from. And obviously, as you point out, that they were they were trying to they wanted this leader that was going to lead them to to take over the world. The, uh, the Bible teaches that if you obey God then Christians will be given the world or the Israelites will be given the world if, if they obey God. Whereas the Talmud says, don't obey God and I'll tell you how you can take it over for yourself. And that, and that, that's the basic difference between it. And it was, I mean, it was a big fear right up into the 1950s, 1960s. And it was seen that because the Jews were the opposing force to Christianity, that was what they were all about was, was taking over the world. Basically, I, we did a, a podcast with Dennis, uh, a few weeks back, I'm trying to remember the name, the, the title of it, but it went into quite some details of, of the earthly kingdom is, is what the Jews were trying to make their own. Whereas the heavenly kingdom is of Christ with the, with the heavenly Jerusalem and all these things we read about in, um, revelations. Whereas the Jews were, were trying to do that in the here and now and, and take it for themselves in the, in the here and now. And this, this was this drive that was, that was going on there that this, um, Sabati Zivi ma- managed to tap into, and one of the one of the things he did was to reverse the feasts around. So instead of fasting, he was telling people that they should be feasting and getting drunk. Uh, instead of being ascetic, they they should be being licentious and and having drunken parties. And and these, these rabbis weren't too happy with that. I, I think he tried to make his birthday into a feast day as well and abolish some of the the original feasts of the rabbis because by this time it wasn't the old testament stuff that he was overturning it was even the rabbi stuff that he was overturning the the, the Tal- talmudic instructions uh which they weren't happy about but uh, yeah please please do continue didymus but that's exactly right every everything you said that's exactly how i understand it and so the, there's like this constant overturning of the previous in jewish thought and it, it never ends it's still going on today And this is why E. Michael Jones, uh, the title for his book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit, is so brilliant is because the like Trotsky said, they have an idea of a permanent revolution in mind. And uh, Sabbatai Tsevi is just one stepping stone in that. But then uh, also the other the other thing you said about them wanting to establish an earthly kingdom rather than a heavenly or spiritual kingdom. They want perfection here on Earth and their view of perfection is uh, quite, quite different to ours. But uh, Matt Johnson did a great podcast a year or two ago about uh, Michael Higgert, and he wrote a book called The Jewish Utopia, where he describes this kind of stuff in detail. And it's it doesn't look too good for me and you, to be honest. Right. It looks it looks pretty bad for people like us. But at any rate, uh, Sabatai Tsevi, he um, was born in the Balkans and I think he had a mixed ancestry. It wasn't particularly um it wasn't particularly uh, Sephardic or Ashkenaz, and those things had split by this time, by the way. Before about the year 1000, there's not too much of an obvious difference between those two groups, but by this time, by the time he was born, there was. And so he's sort of a, a mixed Jewish character born in Greece or the Balkans, and he goes on this wild tour. Uh, he probably was probably mentally ill, but he was highly charismatic. And he went all throughout the Levant, partly into Europe, uh, North Africa, went to Alexandria, went to Palestine, went to all these different places and built up an enormous following of at least tens of thousands and possibly hundreds of thousands of Jews who got on board with him and said, this guy really is going to be the Messiah. He's going to bring all this great stuff to us. We just need to follow him. And there are even um, letters extant from the period from the 17th century about Jews in Holland and other places basically selling all of their worldly goods and converting all their capital into liquid assets so that when he did institute the new Jewish capital in Jerusalem, they could pick up and move there. And they were laughing at the goyim, you know, and being really rude about this time because they thought that, you know, their their paradise was finally about to arrive. But as you say, he got into all these difficulties with the rabbis because he was overthrowing their stuff pretty much completely. And then he finally ran afoul of the Ottoman uh, sultan who uh, called his bluff and said, either you're going to convert to Islam or I'm going to kill you. 
And of course, he converted to Islam and that basically destroyed his movement. The entire thing collapsed. But you need to say something. I, I think he was. Um, yeah, the, the Sultan said uh, you can either prove that you're the Messiah. We'll fire loads of arrows at you or we'll behead you or, or you can become a Muslim. And uh, he just put the put the um, turban on his head and, and, became right. a, and became a Muslim after that. But I think the Sultan found him quite entertaining. At first, and and he kept, and he he kept him on a on a revenue, and there were other Jews that would go out go out to see him. But the, but but just to take it back a bit, I mean, the first thing that he did, he said that he could fly, and then uh, he got this big audience together where he said because he'd said that he could fly, and then he said that they weren't pure enough to to see him to actually be able to do it. It's like all, all yeah. things like this throughout. It's quite um quite comical, and he and this this whore. Um, said that she was supposed to marry him, this, this Dutch whore. And he called for her and, and, and she followed him and, and she became like his queen, this, this prostitute where he was turning everything upside down. Uh, and, and obviously lots of licentiousness that was going on here. And I think it might have been around 1666. And I think that, that that's was right. 666 was the, was the time that they predicted that was when the Messiah was going to come. I mean, what a coincidence. It's going to have 666 yeah, that, six in it. It just feeds into their numerology and their gematria and all these other things. They're, you know, they're, they're a slightly autistic people generally. They're highly neurotic and slightly autistic. And so things like that really catch their interest. And that was another uh, reason as to why he was so successful. But uh, also to comment on the sociological aspect of Jewish life, you know, uh, you, you sometimes feel sorry for the little Jews because uh, Talmudic culture and rabbinic culture absolutely crushes the little Jews. They uh, especially when they lived in the ghetto, the big Jews live high on the hog. Uh, they essentially have oligarchy as their natural political and social arrangement. They have a few people who are very rich and powerful. They have their servants, and then everybody else is essentially an underclass. And uh, it's no coincidence that as soon as they get control of Western countries, that's what they try to implement on us, and that's why we hate it so much because it's not our natural arrangement. But uh, people like Sabbatai Sevi, when they get uh, uh, some power in the Jewish community, they try to break down these barriers, and all the little Jews get really excited and happy because now they don't get to—they don't have to be crushed by the rabbis anymore. And you could see, you know, maybe 300 years later, 250 years later, that's a big reason as to why all the the Jews become communists and anarchists and social revolutionaries is because they really want to get out of the ghetto and they hate the rabbis and they would rather just go burn everything down than to continue living like that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, it does make a it lot does. of sense. And the way that their system, which is basically what we're having to live under now, is just not natural to us. But but it is natural to them. We can see that um, we can see that through throughout history. I would recommend that people just look up um, the Wikipedia page on this Sabati Zevi because it is it is entertaining learning about him um but then uh, and then after that when, when he when he collapsed people were still going out there and were becoming muslims because i think what he said was that was all part of the plan um and, right. and this was part of yeah. the reversal of everything you had to then become a muslim as well uh, after being a jew and then i think it, or it might have been the next one Fra i can't remember if it was jacob frank or it was uh sabati zevi that said and then there was another religion after that so you had to become a Jew, then you had to become a Muslim, and then there was going to be a new religion after that. And there were there were still people that um, followed him right up to the end that were traveling from Europe to uh, to wherever he was, Constantinople, I think he was, um, to convert to Islam and, and become a Muslim. Oh, and he also had to marry another Muslim wife as well. He was given a, a Muslim wife as well as his uh, as well as his whore queen. But yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Do continue. It is. And so this guy, even though he was a failure, he didn't accomplish what he wanted to and he didn't he didn't achieve what his followers thought he could. Nevertheless, he cast a really long shadow on history and uh, the basic ideas of messianism, antinomianism and then this uh, conversion or false conversion to other religions. These ideas stay around and he didn't originate the false conversion that that had really gained massive prominence uh, around. 1490, you know, that time in Spain and Portugal, because both of those empires or you know, the Spanish and the Portuguese both basically told their Jews, either you have to convert to Catholicism or you've got to get out. And there were a lot of them who didn't want to lose their money. They didn't want to liquidate their assets. And so they they performed false conversions 
And that really messed up things for the Jews who did make sincere conversions to Christianity, sort of poisoned the well in that regard, and uh, created no end of trouble uh, for those for those people for the next 200 years. But so uh, he sort of picked up that idea of these false conversions and transmitted it through all of his followers. So just imagine you've got this this really charismatic cult leader, essentially, which is what he was. And he spreads these ideas throughout tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of European Jews and uh, who are fanatical followers of his, at least for a short time. And so now you can't get those ideas out because they're in there, right? They're baked in now. And this resurfaces in Poland about, what, 50 or 80 years later in the form of uh, a Polish Jew named Jacob Frank. And he uh, picks up several of his key ideas from Sabbatai Tsevi and claims to be the reincarnation of Sabbatai Tsevi. So, in fact, you know, hey, Tsevi didn't, didn't actually fail at all because I'm back, I'm here, and this time we're going to do an even better job than we did last time. And um, he pushes the antinomianism in a different direction, whereas Sabbatai Tsevi and his people did everything out in public. They would have, you know, big public feasts or orgies or just gigantic public celebrations. The Frankists, the people who are associating with Jacob Frank or Jakob Frank, as he was probably called, they did everything privately. They were a secret society. And uh, they performed, you know, really um, horrible acts uh, like incest, um, uh, child abuse, theft, murder. They basically did everything wrong that you can think of. And their idea specifically was that the more evil you do, the sooner paradise will arrive. They had the idea that committing evil acts will hasten the uh, the millennial age or the, or the full arrival of the Messiah or the triumph of their Messiah. I think one of the weirdest things with this is is that um, even though they were like that and, and the rabbis were against them, they actually had some protection from the church. And, and with this idea that um, they could be, they could just convert to these other religions, they were converting to Christianity, obviously not being Christians, going going on with all this uh, debauchery. But the church was saying, "Look at all these Jews that we've managed to to convert." But but they were actually these Frankists, and there were there were there were priests that were protecting these Frankists because they were against the Talmud. They they burned a load of Talmuds at this time, as well. And, and that was on the say so of these Franks. And, and so they thought, well, these Franks are, are really good. And, and they're just like a different, um, a different, a different type of Christian, as it, as it were. But they, they were totally, totally degenerate, even more degenerate than the last lot. So you can see that there's this real corruption of the church is, is starting to occur here now because of these guys. And I think at the same time, you then started to have these, these Kabbalistic interpretations of of the new testament and, and of the bible and there were a lot of uh, christian kabbalists that started to spring up i'm not sure if it was uh, at this time 1750 pro- probably around then that you that you started to have a uh, kabbalistic exegesis of the bible and and these jews would would claim that that um you know that they accept or accepted christianity as part of the same same sort of tradition and i guess these frankists m- must have been a part of that because that was really big for a while was um christian kabbalah and, and all the brightest minds of uh, of Europe were were interested in it and were researching it. And they and they like you pointed out, there were certain Jews that were trying to expose this, certain conversos that that were genuine Christian conversos that were trying to expose this and and saying, look, you shouldn't be applying the, the Kabbalah to the to the Christian Bible. But but of course, they, they were ending up losing out because of the ego. Basically, there was a there was a fight between uh, Pfefferkorn, which was one of these converso Jews and Roichlin or Richelin. And he was saying, look, you cannot be, Pfefferkorn was saying, look, this, this is all de- degenerate. You can't be applying this stuff to the, to the Bible. And this, this, uh, Richelieu or whatever his name is was saying, um, well, this helps to interpret it. And, and they ended up not listening to Pfefferkorn and, and listening to this, this Richelin guy who was, who was saying, well, I know how I have a, better interpretation of this and this comes from the esteemed rabbis and and what have you and it, and it was all all falsehoods that started entering entering the church at this time i mean that's going off at a, at a bit of a tangent but it, it's it's you know it's still to do with the kabbalah but not so much to do with the frankists or, or maybe it was what, what do you think 
Well, it's all it all has to be directly related because it's the same ideas. It's just how they get transmitted. I, I think that the Kabbalah started invading European thought probably as early as 1400. And, you know, there were uh, there were people in the Catholic Church in the, the late 1400s who were already getting instruction from the rabbis uh, and creating this, you know, so-called Christian Kabbalah, which doesn't make any sense, right? There can be no such thing. Christianity and Kabbalism are completely incompatible. You can't, you can't believe both things at the same time, but that's what they call it. That's what they say. And those things started, uh, they entered, they entered the Christian European West and the intellectual world probably in the 1400s. And so by the time you get to this era in the 1700s, it's, uh, it's already been there for several hundred years. And it forms the basis of all of the alchemy, the demonology, um, uh, the the witchcraft type type stuff that these rich people would practice just for kicks or because they wanted to, you know, feel like they were more educated than everyone else. And uh, it so it formed it formed the basis of a lot of this. And people like I want to say Isaac Newton, you know, even he was one of these guys who's thought to be a a big precursor to science and part of the enlightenment and all that sort of thing. But, you know, they were all practicing this alchemical Kabbalistic nonsense. Um, and John D as well. You said, John D with his Enochian keys, trying to conjure up what he thought were angels. I think that, that was that's a part right. of this as well. That's right. So, you know, any of these guys that you dig into from that era, uh, it seems to have been rife all over the place. It was in it was in Poland. It was in Germany. It was in France. It was in England. It was all over the place. And uh, the last podcast that you did with uh, Dennis, where you guys were talking about the two different forms of masonry, uh, the English or Rosicrucian and then the, the continental form. You know, you can you can take this same argument and work it back through there and show that a lot of this Kabbalism is probably in with Templars and all of these other groups. So it's almost like there are different strands of this this same thing. It starts in different places in different times and they're all moving through history in parallel next to each other. And sometimes they jump over and, you know, cross fertilize and create new new strains of this disease that just keeps on infecting our thought as we go forward in history. I think it played but, a, uh, large, a large part in Freemasonry, didn't it? The, the Kabbalah and Kabbalistic doctrines ended up playing a large yes. part in Freemasonry. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that pretty soon, I think, or we could go ahead and talk about it now. Um, Jacob Frank, Jakob Frank, whatever we want to call him, he uh, was getting pressured basically by the Russian imperial government because of all this weird stuff that his people were doing in Poland. And so they moved to Germany where the climate was uh, a little, I guess, more open because of Protestantism. You know, Europe had gone through these religious wars, and so there was a little bit more religious toleration in Germany, and so they moved there. Actually, they moved to the, the Czech lands. They were in Moravia is where they went to. And uh, they set up shop there. And he eventually died in that area, I think, in Austro in Austro Hungary is where he died. But they had, you know, several hundred or maybe a couple thousand of these people who were in this Frankist cult. And they're, they were the elite of the elite uh, because I guess they concentrated their money and wealth. And honestly, they may have already been connected with the Rothschilds at this time. It's not really known for sure. But they managed to get high positions in the uh, Austro-Hungarian economic and political life. Uh, the guy that the book is about, the, the Gershom Scholem book that I translated, his name is Moses Dabrushka, and his father was a big tobacco merchant in Austro-Hungary. The Jews had the monopoly on all the tobacco that was going to be sold in Austro-Hungary, and they paid their proceeds directly to the crown and the state. And so that gave them a direct personal connection with the emperor of Austro-Hungary. And uh, that's just uh, unfortunately what history is like for us Europeans is that these people who are, you know, some of the worst of the worst on planet Earth are sitting next to our nobility, our monarchs, our elites, our rulers. And that's who they're getting advice from and working with rather than rather than our people. And so that's unfortunate. But um, what, what these, was he like? What was the Austri Austrian uh, Hungarian emperor like? This one was he a good one, or, or was he a bad one? Was he infected with these ideas? Was he supporting the Jews, or, or was he standing up for us at the time? Do you know? 
I want to say it was Joseph II, and so this is a guy that Hitler really admired because he was progressive and he wanted to bring uh, Austro-Hungary into a time of strength and national unity because, of course, they were broken up between five or six major different ethnic groups. And if you've read, you know, if, for anyone who's read Mein Kampf, you know, you know what Hitler thought about that. He thought the Germans were getting the short end of the stick and they were having to do all the work and all the other ethnic groups were getting an unfair share of the benefit of German labor. And so uh, Joseph II was trying to modernize the place. And, you know, if you, if you're against progressive ideas like I am, this is kind of a, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag because progress and modernization can really be covers for things that are bad for us, right? Traditional, uh, traditional European civilization is better than progress, quote unquote. But I think that, uh, due to their access to money and political influence, I think that's why somebody like Joseph II would have been willing to work with these Frankists. And so maybe, maybe his, his goals were good. And he was trying to achieve them by whatever means were at his disposal. And that was the basis of the relationship. But I couldn't tell you I couldn't tell you too much more about it than that. But that's the sense I get from reading it. Right, right, right. So, uh, yeah, he he was really just trying to do his do his best for his people. But when you've got these people, these other this other other ones alongside you that are obviously very, very intelligent and seem to know a lot. And they're coming out with ideas that you've never, never heard of before. And you've got no resistance to them they can quite easily break you down i mean this this is how all the stuff that's going on today is is going on is because we we haven't had a resistance to it we haven't thought well that's right hang on a minute these 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 ideas these people giving us these ideas may be giving them not not for our own good but for their own good and of course it gets put across as that this is for your own good this is you know this is diversity it's a great thing um we want everybody to be friendly uh, why wouldn't you want another a man to marry another man it's just love you know it's always put across as it's being a positive thing and it's a great idea and it's going to be wonderful for the for the community and of course it's not it's to the benefit of the of the people that are giving it to us not to our benefit and i guess the, the same thing was going on here is probably dazzled by the um by the intelligence of these people and the knowledge that the secret knowledge that they that they had because that plays into this as well and anything that's secret um it has a gloss to it doesn't it and and you want to find out about it and you want a part of this secret knowledge so i think that that probably played in with it as well why people would definitely yeah I, i think that's exactly right and you don't really know how much these european monarchs at the time actually knew about these people you know, maybe they didn't really know the depth of it. They didn't know how depraved they were and what their motives were. And uh, this Moses Debrushka character, he and his family members, almost all of them converted to Christianity. And so, therefore, the court, the, the European court, the Austro-Hungarian court, would have accepted them because they thought, look, these guys are good Christians. They have a lot of money. They're, they're motivated to, to work on our behalf. And they just really didn't know what they were all about or what they were doing. And so that's that's sort of the... That's sort of the story about them is that these people spread out through uh, Germany, uh, the Czech lands, France and England, and uh, they seem to pop up everywhere in history after this. They also became highly influential in the Polish national struggle for independence. So the Frankists who did not move into Germany and the Czech lands, the, the ones who stayed in Poland, they supposedly converted to Christianity. They married Polish nobility and they became part of the, the wave of revolutionary activists in the 19th century that were constantly rebelling against imperial Russia. And that's a topic I haven't gone into too deeply, but it definitely exists and it's there. And so when you think about these national liberation struggles, when you think about the, the fact that they could possibly be controlled by these, um, you know, these Sabbatean Frankist uh, incestuous uh, cliques or whatever, it really gives it quite a different cast to things like that. Well, it shows that it has, has really deep roots, doesn't it? And this is this, yes. this subversion has been going on for a long time. And they, they build up their numbers, they build up their wealth, they build up their power, uh, they build up their prestige. And, and then before you know it, they're, they're leading the revolution or they're funding, uh, Gentiles to be the front men at, at the front of the revolution. And we see the same thing today with, 
um, gen- Gentile frontmen for things like um, Black Lives Matter or, or for Antifa. You know, the, the Jews will stay there in the, in the background. They'll be the ones funding it. They'll be the ones in- encouraging it. But they're not necessarily always the ones that are leading it. More more so, they come out now and lead. But um, it wasn't wasn't quite so in the past, was it? I think the, the civil in the civil rights movement, they had a lot of um, uh, a lot of blacks that uh, eventually got. And really annoyed about this, that the, the the Jews were leading from from behind, and they were the ones that were setting all this up, and they and they wanted to to do these things themselves, but they weren't weren't as good at it as the Jews. They just they just have this revolutionary spirit which sets them apart from everybody else, and and means that uh, they're the best leaders for the revolution. Unfortunately, that's right. And so uh, this character, this Moses Tabrushka character, after he converted to Christianity. He changed his name to uh, Franz Schoenfeld, and then he started to move in all of these Masonic circles in Germany and, uh, well, North North and South Germany both. And he and his friends, who I don't think most of them weren't Jews, most of them were Christians of one type or another, uh, even religious men of one type or another, but who were seduced by these magical, you know, esoteric uh, teachings, they formed basically Illuminist Lodges. And they would colonize and invade uh, the type of English, quote unquote, or Christian, quote unquote, lodges that um, already existed in Germany at the time. The Germans were basically imitating the English and they would start their own lodges and they would be fairly Christian and rationalist is the way that Gershom Scholem describes them. They would be Christian and rationalist. And then uh, Schoenfeld, the Bruschka, and his friends would come in, they would get initiated, and then they would sort of pull a few influential members of the lodge aside and say, hey, you know, we, we got some, some really some secret interesting teachings that you might want to hear about. And then once they would get two or three of the members in that lodge going, they would basically form a super lodge that would be above it. And they traveled all over Germany, north and south, and started inducting people in various lodges and creating this parallel network. Well, uh, eventually the whole thing blew up because it, it was exposed. And so there was a big struggle in Germany between basically the exoteric, which is not quite the right word, word for it, but the exoteric lodges and the esoteric lodges. And this is, you know, again, it's, it's exactly the same thing that you were talking about with Dennis on that previous show and the struggle basically between the Grand Orient style and the uh, and the other, um, I'm sure you have something to say about that. I'm just wondering how the French Revolution ties in with this, around, and around about what time? Because it, it didn't he have something to do with that, uh, or am I am I wrong there? No, he he definitely did. So after this this episode with this work that he had been doing in these German lodges, he sort of gave up on that, went back to Austria, and then uh, essentially became an agent for the next Austro-Hungarian emperor, which was Leopold II, if I remember correctly. And so as an agent of Leopold II, he then goes to Strasbourg and later Paris, and this is after the revolution has already started. Uh, so he starts to move in these uh, revolu- the, the furthest left revolutionary circles uh, in Strasbourg, and uh, which are the Jacobins, right? That's where we get that that name. They're they're the far left, most violent revolutionaries of of that period. He starts to move in those circles, and he changes his name for a third time. Now he's Junius Frey, and or Junius Fry, you know, for freedom. And he's got this faux classical name of Junius because, of course, the uh, the revolutionaries wanted to overthrow Christianity, and so you have to have something else to latch onto for culture, and so they tried to ape or emulate the classical period, and so he's got this Roman name of Junius. And he uh, gets involved in this stuff, and he barely escapes Strasbourg, uh, keeps his head on his shoulders. Um, and then he goes to Paris with his brother and his sister, and they uh, pretend that they have a lot more money than they really have, and they wine and dine all of these big-time French revolutionaries uh, like Danton, Georges Danton, and uh, almost he almost gets made a citizen of the new French Republic, even though you know he's basically never been to France in his life, and he's already meeting the top people in the revolutionary clique. And then there's a big financial scandal. And he gets his head cut off uh, at the height of the um, the terror. So the the famous terror uh, wipes this guy out, fortunately. But after he's already had quite an extraordinary career by that time. 
and managed to uh, change the ideas that were going on in the in these Masonic lodges as well, infecting them with these with these ideas. And uh, it was from those lodges that this this um, French Revolution was was taken off from in the first place. That's where um, that's where it all began, isn't it? With the the, the mottos: liberty, equality, fraternity. Is it all all these Masonic ideas that were finding their expression in in revolution and you and obviously he's going to be thinking well that that's where i want to be in the center of this but obviously he he fell foul of it himself I and mean, rather like um i don't know like 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 a scorpion being stung by its own tail i should imagine uh, yeah. like the left will always end up eating itself doesn't it i think this yeah is that's a, that that famous quote about the french revolution that she's like saturn she eats her own children and so he got his just desserts. And as you point out, you know, yeah, he, he already injected these ideas in. Uh, and it, it, there, it couldn't possibly be a coincidence, could it, that the revolution was formulated, that the Jacobin work was being done in these lodges. And then you have the same type of guy coming from this Frankist Sabbatean perspective who also just manages to be in there at the time when all of this stuff is being done. It's uh, it's highly suspicious. And honestly, the work that Gershom Sholem did, this book, it's not going to tell the whole story because uh, these type of people aren't going to leave all their records behind. And then even if these Jewish uh, researchers find it, they're not going to expose it all to the public view. So certainly it goes even deeper than what we know. But just to find all of these influences all around here at the same time, it's, uh, you know, it's the smoke of Satan, basically. Well, we can tie in um, what we were, t- or what I was talking about with Dennis last week as well, with the Templars and and Jacques de Molay, and the Jacobins took their name from Jacques de Molay, and they, they were all kicked out of Britain. Um, and when the Hanover- Hanoverian monarchy took over in Britain, and the and the Jacobins were kicked out, and then they headed over to to France. So you had you had their influence on the masonry there as well, as as well as this this Kabbalistic. Influence. So I guess you've got a cross between the, the Kabbalah and the esotericism and the, the anarchists and the, the Bolshevik styles and, and, and the wanting to tear, tear everything down. You've got, um, really just evil from, from all sides that is, that is mixing together in this. Uh, when you think about it, you've got to understand the esoteric stuff, you've got to be incredibly intelligent. And yet to, to be wanting to destroy everything and, and to be an anarchist and be wanting anarchy. And it's usually something you, you would associate with people that, that weren't really that bright. And yet, yet you got the both of them working together here just to, just to destroy everything and just, just motivated by hatred. And you got the more intelligent ones manipulating the less intelligent ones and telling them that everything's going to be brilliant at the end of this. If you, if you just destroy everything first. It's the same mentality today with uh, Black Lives Matter and, and Antifa. They've got no idea what they're going to put in place after they tear everything down. They, it, it, and now it's directed at white people. It's all directed at the racists. Uh, whereas back then it was directed at the aristocracy. It was, it was directed at the church. It's moved on from that to all white people that it's now directed at uh, and we can feel we can feel the uh, we can feel that in everything that we see on the television and the and the public narrative it, it's all about hating whitey uh, eventually i do think a, a time will come the same as it happened in in france with the french revolution and it, and it will be just be white people it will be open season on white people if, if things carry on the way that they're the way that they're going do, do you know if there was if the, if like today where we have all this mainstream media that's pushing pushing this narrative back then were there lots of pamphlets and newspapers and books that were pushing all these ideas all these revolutionary ideas that one french priest who wrote the the history of jacobinism in france i can't remember his name off the top of his head but my friend Michael Joseph, he's the one who turned me on to that. He read the whole thing. It's an enormously long book. But in it, he talks about in that book uh, that that French priest talks about how these pamphlets would appear, you know, like spontaneously. And it would be a huge quantity of them. It was something that couldn't be done quickly and it was way too expensive. And so it proves that there was big money behind producing that revolutionary propaganda. It's not something that, you know, little uh, small time activists were just printing this stuff up on their own and distributing it around the area where they lived and worked. It was a big operation. 
and exactly whose money funded it and all that. It's just not, it's something that's kind of lost to history. We don't really know. I'm just thinking, I, I'm sure I read um, somewhere that Rosicrucianism started like that with the Rosy Cross and, the, and there were pamphlets, esoteric pamphlets that were actually put out and that was the origin of Rosicrucianism. Do you know anything, anything about that? I'm sure that it was. I do know that the story that we've told here uh, briefly about uh, the, this Frank and Sabbatean stuff, I know that there's another uh, group that's similar to Rosicrucianism and part of Masonry called Martinism, and that was started by a Jewish converso named Martinez de Pasquale, and he was basically going out doing similar things where he was proselytizing these different lodges and trying to inject this um, Kabbalistic esotericism into it. He was doing that in France about 20 years before the period we're discussing here. So it was going on in different places at different times by different people, seemingly independently. But, you know, who knows how much they were connected. And also, I was, I was, uh, at this time with the French Revolution, that's when they emancipated the Jews. So, I mean, I, I should imagine that, that before this time, with the in- infiltration of the lodges, that all took place with, with conversos, with Jews that had, had claimed to be Christian and then brought these ideas with them into the lodges. Or were the lodges actually accepting Jews in at this time? Because Freemasonry really acted as, as a front for the Jews. And, and then the people from the Masonic lodges would, would make the changes in politics and, and what have you. But they were, in, in actual fact, doing, doing Jewish bidding. And, and they always looked up to these, these Jewish ideas. So did they actually have Jews in these lodges or were they just um, conversos that they were allowing in at this time, do you know? They would accept people like Moses de Baruchka, who uh, was born and raised Jewish, but then allegedly converted to Christianity. And so that's how these Jews would get into these lodges. And I think that situation maintained for another 50 or 60 years until I think it was in Britain. I'm not quite sure. I think it was in Britain where the first, you know, professing Jews were actually allowed to enroll in lodges. For a long time, they didn't allow that, but they would allow these people who performed either a true or a false conversion to enter. So we ended up with with corruption of the church and also the, the corruption of Freemasonry through this i mean it's a strange thing you know you think well well, people can change or what have you but it's probably only a very small proportion of these conversos that actually turned out to genuinely be trying to follow christianity they're outweighed by the large group of conversos that um, brought nothing with them but but corruption and subversion and and changed the church completely i mean it, 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 a lot of people say well you you know you've got we've got to allow these people in you've got to allow them got, got to allow them to convert but at what cost you know at, at what cost there have been good ones um the, the ignatius loyola uh the pfeffercorn that i uh, suggested earlier but they're outweighed i think 10 to 1 or maybe 100 to 1 by uh by these by these no goods basically who are just using that as a cover Do you think, do you agree with that? Or what are your thoughts on that? I do. And and the worst part of it is that not only, you know, Orthodox Judaism is a problem for European civilization and Christianity. It functions sort of like a parasite on us where it just sucks out money and provides degenerate influences. But then these guys, these Frankists, these Sabbateans are like sleeper cells within Orthodox uh, Judaism that are even worse. They're worse for the Orthodox Jews and for us because you can't tell who they are, where they're going, what they're doing, because they're so secretive and so perverse. And we even know that people like Louis Brandeis, who was a, um, a United States Supreme Court justice, And Stephen Wise, who was basically the leader of the American Jewish community for 20 or 30 years, uh, Brandeis was definitely a Frankist. And Stephen Wise, he probably was, too. So how many of the other leading, you know, Jewish leaders and intellectuals and uh, people who are basically directing all of the other Jews, how many of them are these Frankists as well? It's a big problem. Yeah, it's uh, amazing to think that they, that they are that they're still going. It's been really interesting to learn about the history of it right from the start, right the way up to the present day. So, thank you very much for coming on today, Didymus. Thank you very much, listeners, for listening. I will be back next week with more Truth Without Radio for you, and of course, we do hope you have a great weekend ahead of you.